All right, take your Bible and join me in the book of Colossians, chapter 1. I'll take just a few moments here, a brief time together as we look at the Scriptures and uh, really put a capstone on all of these praises tonight, thanking the Lord, praising the Lord, following the example of the Word of God, because that is what we build our faith on, what we build our life around. And we have no greater example than what is recorded in the Word of God when we think about praising and giving thanks to the Lord. Colossians chapter number 1, I'll ask you to stand as we read. I'll read verses 1 through 14, and uh, we won't cover all 14 verses here, but I do want to read them all. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Read verse 3 out loud with me if you would. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the world, in the word, the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be fill, filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding." that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or suitable uh, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Lord, I pray that You would bless our time as we consider the Scriptures tonight. May I decrease and may You increase, and may we magnify Your Word above all Your name. We come here tonight to give You thanks, and we say, Blessed be your name, the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There are a number of themes woven throughout the book of Colossians. We come here to this passage and we observe that thankfulness becomes one of the most obvious, at least to me, as I read this. Even though Paul had been imprisoned, this is one of the prison epistles, and, and I was helped out, I believe it was, uh, maybe it was Dr. Stelzer or someone, uh, Galatians class, Ephesians, Galatians in the prison epistles, and uh, maybe it was somewhere else along the journey. Uh, I had someone help me remember how the books go. <laughs> go eat popcorn. Maybe you've helped some Sunday school students with that. Uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians, and the prison epistles. So this is one of those prison epistles that Paul would have written from his uh, jail cell. Even though he's imprisoned, he's still grateful in his heart. I, I see the example of Christ hearkening to our time together on Sunday night, looking at when Jesus gave thanks with the cross looming on the horizon. Here, Paul sitting in a, a, a place where uh, it might be easy to consider the circumstances and not be thankful. He remains grateful in his heart. I have seen, and I'm sure Pastor Ward, others that have been in ministry, uh, have seen Christians lose their gratitude. 
and gain an attitude of, uh, of uh, bitterness, discontentment when misfortune comes their way, other hardships. In the ministry, it's, it's rather shocking sometimes. I shouldn't be shocked by now, but it, it, it is kind of shocking still when even the most gracious and thankful believers, the, most, the, the people that you would think bitterness would be a million miles away from them, even that one becomes unthankful and bitter when hard times come their way. It's tragic. Not so with the Apostle Paul. There were a number of things that Paul was thankful for. We read a couple of them. I'll just draw them to the surface. In verse 3, he says, We give thanks to God. Very simply, he was thankful to God. What is the ultimate object of our praise, of our thanksgiving? It needs to be God. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. That's an interesting point to ponder, isn't it? Paul here sitting in prison was thankful for what God was doing in the lives of others. That's a good way to get your eyes off of your own circumstances is to see what the Lord is doing in the lives of others and say God's still at work. Things might be happening. Things might be going on. Paul here sits in prison. Others were not in prison. Others were still free to travel and free to preach the gospel and free to go to towns and free to uh, oversee churches and, and establish ministries and continue to serve. Not Paul. Others were free to do that. Paul was a faithful minister of the gospel up until the time of his death. He, he remained faithful to preach the gospel even when he was in chains and in bondage. <laughs> were there other Christians in his day that weren't as faithful as him? Uh, he gives us record of others like Demas who had forsaken him, having loved this present world. Uh, why wasn't it Demas that was sitting where Paul was? Uh, there, there are a million ways we could come at this and ponder and say, why Paul? Why in that moment? But Paul didn't do that. You know, Paul didn't have this thought in his mind of, well, how come God let me go to prison and not those who were less faithful? Why isn't it somebody else that's sitting here? That wasn't Paul's attitude at all. I think it's, it's easy for most Christians, most believers, myself included, to be thankful to God for blessings in their own life. You look around and you say, okay, I see this. That's a blessing. I'm thankful for that. This, this is a blessing. I'm thankful for that. God has been good. We've heard testimony after testimony tonight about the goodness of God and, and, and the blessings, even those mercies, sometimes even intangible material things that we can, we can tangibly see. This is a blessing of the Lord, and we're thankful for those, rightfully so. But I've, I feel that there are few that have learned to rejoice like this when God blesses others. When God blesses someone other than, than me or you, it, we live in a very narcissistic society. And some of that creeps into Christianity. I, I'm afraid it does. We think about ourselves and promoting ourselves. You know, Paul was looking at what God was doing in the lives of others. And uh, that has helped me. Because with the challenges that we, that we endure, the things that we go through, we can take a step back and, and just ask, is God working in and through someone else? Is, is God meeting needs for someone else? Is God furthering the ministry of someone else that, that I've had an opportunity to be an influence in their life in some way? Paul was able to thank God for that. Under this, being thankful to God... I, I was reading and studying. I came across some things that I wanted to share with you as well about some strange things the Christian should be grateful for. I think this was uh, Nolan Jackson. He had, a, he had some things that he wrote on this. I'll share that with you. And, and he was referencing Philippians 4.4, not our passage that we're looking at tonight, but Philippians 4.4. You know that verse. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And uh, he went on to, to say, you know, every Christian should be joyful in suffering and should not at any time go around with a long face moaning and groaning. God can give to every Christian joy in suffering so that the Christian can be joyful, rejoicing in all things and at all times. L listen to this list, okay? 
he, he unpacked it a little bit, and he said that we should be thankful in beatings. When's the last time that you uh, stopped and prayed and said, Lord, thank you for that beating I just received? Acts chapter 5, verse 40 and 41, read it. He says, and to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles, and what? Okay. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And, and then we continue reading, and it says, uh, and they departed from the presence of the council, maybe limping a little, I don't know. And how did they depart? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. They equated that beating and, and what they endured to something greater than just themselves. They looked beyond the present circumstance. Now, I'm sure they weren't thankful for the flogging that came their way. Nobody should be treated that way. So we don't want to misunderstand that. But can we rejoice? Can we look past the beatings necessarily and say, I was counted worthy to suffer? If it's for the name of Christ, we should be able to rejoice. Now, you need to compare Peter, because Peter also reminds us that if we suffer for wrongdoing, uh, that's on us. That, that's a different type of, uh, of pain that we have in our lives. We'll bring that on ourselves. But if we are suffering and we can, we can pinpoint that, hey, we, we've made the devil angry or whatever you want to call it. We've, we've really upset things or we've come in the devil's crosshairs or he's using people or, or whatever's happening, these circumstances. When we come into those times, we can count it all joy, right? When we fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith work with patience, to quote James, so they departed in the, in the pres from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy. Next time you go through something, maybe metaphorically similar, spiritually similar, perhaps one day physically similar. It, it wasn't too long ago that we were praying for our pastor friends and those that were serving with them just across the border to the north of us for things that they were enduring that we never thought we would hear about coming against churches. Uh, friends in California that go to churches out there that were enduring grueling things. Other places around the country, Colorado was no different. We had battles on our own front. Let us not forget that America, blessed though she be, she is wayward. We pray not that it would physically come to this, but when I study the history of Jesus' followers, what I find out is when a nation allows the persecution of God's people, it never works well for that nation. It never turns out good for them because of persecuting God's people. Why? Because God will take up the cause of His own. And it will only be a matter of time. We pray not for that. But, but here we can, we can see they were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. Uh, he went on to say that, that we should be thankful as Christians when we're being hated, when we're being reproached and cast out. And he quoted Luke 6.22. Uh, we'll read that. Blessed are ye when men shall, here's a word people don't like today, hate you. That's what the Bible says. That, that's a biblical term. You need to understand it in the context of the Bible. It doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means today. Despised esteemed little, and he goes on uh, to say, separated here from the company, blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. When's the last time we stopped and said, thank you, Lord, for the hate that's coming my way right now. Thank you, Lord, for the reproach I'm experiencing. Thank you, Lord, for the evil that I'm suffering, evil in the sense of hurt. Sticks and stones may break my bones. Words, words can really hurt. Words can really hurt. He uh, went on to reference Job. That'd be a good place to think about when we're thinking about thankfulness. Job chapter 5 and verse 17 says, uh, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Lord, thank you for the correcting. Thank you for the chastening. Thank you for the correction. 
Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Sounds uh, similar to Hebrews 12 in some ways, doesn't it? As a loving Heavenly Father, we thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is a Father in every sense, and He will correct us when needed. When's the last time we actually genuinely, deep down inside our hearts, said thank you for correcting me because... I needed it. I was going a different direction than I know what pleases you, and, and Lord, I needed that. Can we say thank you and praise you for that as well? Thankful in correction. Thankful, uh, Hebrews 10.34, thankful in loss. We heard testimony tonight that even in the midst of loss in our lives, that we would consider loss, we still can be thankful if we'll look beyond those things. Hebrews 10.34 is a great promise. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully, listen now, took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Lord, thank you for when I was spoiled. Uh, that means like taking the spoils of war. Thank you for when I was left with nothing out of that whole situation. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that I have nothing out of, uh, nothing, you know, materially out of that. My goods are gone. Thank you that my goods are gone. Knowing in yourselves, this is where the key is. I believe it lies right here in, in the mind and in the heart. Knowing. What is it that you know that helps you through these times? Knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Better and enduring. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, Jesus said, where thieves steal and Moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I almost want to sing the song now, Brother Mike. Lay up treasures in heaven, because that's where it lasts forever. We can be thankful in loss because we know it's only temporary, and it's the spoiling of our material goods, perhaps, but it's for a greater cause. When it's, when it's for eternity, we can say, thank you, Lord, for the loss. Thank you that I was in a place to suffer that kind of loss to further your will for someone or, or for my own life. Thank you. Thankful in loss. Thankful in poverty. 2 Corinthians 6.10. I've, I've really enjoyed uh, Pastor Ward going through uh, 2 Corinthians verse by verse, just reminding us, those of Macedonia, giving themselves first to the Lord and, and then uh, to others for the sake of the gospel. Thankful in poverty. 2 Corinthians 6.10 As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. As poor yet making many rich. This is the paradox of Christianity, right? It doesn't make sense in the world's economy, but it makes perfect sense in God's economy. As poor yet making many rich. As having nothing yet possessing all things. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We can be thankful even in the times of poverty in our lives that, are, that, that we can see God's hand moving and working. Thankful in suffering. Back in Colossians chapter 1, we didn't read it, but down in verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for His body's sake, which is the church, thankful in sufferings, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Lord, thank you for the suffering. That just doesn't sound like it should fit in a praise service, does it? But that's Bible. That's Bible. Not many Christians are truly this kind of joyful in times of suffering, like the Apostle Paul is. I think they're few and far between, and when you see them, they are gems, aren't they? Real Christians, that's where the rubber meets the road. And this is, this is so because they're not, uh, they're not weighted down. They have their focus in, in the right place. If a Christian does not find himself able to do this in his Christian walk, could it be because they're not filled with the Spirit? Maybe they got saved and they have the Spirit, 
but are they filled? Have they yielded everything? Is there an area in their life that they have yet to yield and they're holding on to that clutches? You know, the monkey with his hand in the cookie jar. Maybe they've never been taught by the Spirit. Maybe the Lord is using this as an opportunity for the Spirit to teach them that's part of what He does. And He shall teach you all things. In John 14, John 16, He shall guide you into all truth. That's what the Spirit does for the believer. The joy of the Lord is my strength, the psalm says. If we're joyful in suffering, then we're going to be strong and we're going to be, I'm careful to use this word, but, but it's, it's a good word, happy. We can be blessed. We can be makarios. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that hunger. And this is the paradox of Christianity. Because the promise comes, they shall be. They shall inherit. They shall see. They shall. We go through something here, but this isn't all there is. We can endure what we go through here only by the grace and strength of God because of what we know we shall receive at His hand later. Following in the steps of Jesus. Stepping in the light. Stepping in the light. How many, though, I wonder, find it easier to rejoice when God punishes another Christian rather than when He blesses another Christian? That wasn't the case with Paul. And that's very wrong, by the way, to live your life that way. It wasn't Paul's example. Paul was thankful to God. Are you thankful to God? Paul was thankful for the gospel. Look with me back in our text in Colossians chapter 1, verse 4 through 6. He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, that's the object. Your faith has to have an object, and that object is Christ Jesus. And of the love, so there's the word faith, and of the love which ye have to all the saints, and for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth, doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. How thankful was Paul for the power of the gospel, working in the lives of others. You see what he's emphasizing here? It's the same things he emphasized, not in the same order, but it's the same things he emphasized and emphasized in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Maybe you have a plaque on your wall like so many do. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is Charity. That charity is the idea of love and action. Charity is a good word, by the way. It's a good Bible word here. It's love and action. It's putting feet to your love. Charity. It's, it's from agape. It's from self-sacrificing love. But he says, these abide, faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Here in Colossians, in our text, he says, it's the faith in Christ. It's the love and it's the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. What does Christ mean to you? Old Vance Havner one time said, It's a privilege to speak to my friends in the name of Him who has called us His friends if we do the things which He's commands, commanded us. Someone asked Charles Kingsley, What is the secret of your beautiful life? He answered, I had a friend. And I've often thought that if this life of mine ever approaches the thought of, uh, of being beautiful and true, it will be because I have found a friend. Oh, such a friend with a capital F. He loved me ere I knew him. He drew me with cords of love. And thus he bound, bound me to him. Old Vance Abner went on to say, I found in Christ a life that is beautifully simple and simply beautiful. He just had a way with words. Beautifully simple and simply beautiful. In Him I find, first of all, pardon. God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. What a testimony about God's forgiveness tonight. Do you know that forgiveness? 
Do you know that pardon? I didn't touch on it on Sunday night, but when Jesus Christ gave thanks, it was for the remission of sins. The word is to release, uh, it is to forgive, it is to pardon. Jesus Christ was thankful for that. Paul was thankful. It means peace. He's the Prince of Peace. Through Him I have peace with God. And as I make my request known to God with thanksgiving, the peace of God that passes all other understanding and all misunderstanding too, garrisons my heart and mind through Christ Jesus. We have pardon. We have peace. We have purpose, he went on. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Put that in your uh, doggy bag. Christ also means power. Christ gives the power to see the purpose through. All power is given unto me, he said. Paul declares, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It means plenty, spiritual abundance. All things are yours, says Paul to the Christian. Again, he speaks of having nothing yet possessing all things. We read that verse earlier. Plenty. And finally, he said, Christ gives me an eternal prospect. Where I am, there you may be also. Whither I go, you know, and the way you know. If it were not so, I would have told you. These are some of the things that Christ meant to old Vance Havner. These are some things that Christ has come to mean to me. Does He mean those things to you? All I need is found in Him. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's all the letters in between. He's the same yesterday, the historic Christ. He's the same today, the indwelling Christ. He's the same tomorrow, the Christ who is coming. Christ is my message. I have no other message apart from Him. There's a story that was recalled of uh, two boats passing each other on the Mississippi when an old gentleman said to a passenger as he pointed to the other boat, Look, yonder's the captain. We, when asked for an explanation, he said, Years ago we were going along like this and I fell overboard and the captain rescued me and since then I just love to point him out. There's the captain. Some years ago, this old sin sick soul was overboard. In water too deep for my wit, I could find no way out. I had no way to navigate to safety. I was lost and undone. I saw death staring me in the face. It's a 14-year-old young man, the captain of my salvation, leaped overboard from glory and came and rescued me. He rescued me. And uh, like that old captain, I just like to point him out. There's the captain. That's from Jesus only. It's a good book. I encourage you to read that sometime. My adaptation there. That's my, my testimony, but go read that sometime in uh, Jesus only. The gospel of Christ had given the people that Paul's writing to in Colossae here faith, hope, and love. We could unpack each one of those and have a series of messages just on those and how many people today yearn for true biblical hope? We were just having a discussion recently, and it was brought up, Brother Farnham's message about hope. It's not some wishy-washy, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow kind of hope. No, this is a hope that is steadfast and sure. It is the anchor of the soul. Paul was thankful to God. Are you thankful to God tonight? Paul was thankful for the gospel and the power of the gospel to work in the lives of others, to bring faith, to bring hope, and to bring love in their life. We need that. He was also thankful for his helpers. And this one really, really gets me. Thankful for his helpers. Verse 7 and 8, he says, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant. Don't just breeze over that. Dear. Epaphras was special to Paul. He was dear to Paul. It becomes trite. You know, we start our letters, dear so-and-so, dear so-and-so, 
do you really mean that? Are they really dear to your heart? He is a dear fellow servant who is for you a faithful minister. That servant, a faithful minister of Christ. Who do we serve? We don't serve ourselves. We don't serve the church necessarily. We serve Christ. What we do is for Him and for Him first and foremost, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Faithful companions in the gospel ministry, hard to find. Pastor Ward, hard to find faithful companions who will just stick by the stuff and be there with you through thick and thin, pray with you through things. Who is it in your life that you can be thankful for like Paul is thankful for here? Like he was for Epaphras. Paul found a tremendous amount of security right here in his friend Epaphras. There was a there was a man by the name of Epaphras one time that traveled through Colossae and he brought the gospel of Jesus Christ and he ministered for Jesus Christ and he was a dear fellow laborer of Paul. There was a youth pastor one time named Terry and he brought the gospel to a Baptist youth meeting in a little town called Dallas, Georgia where a 14-year-old lost young man drowning in the sea of sin needed to hear the gospel and get saved. He also brought others along, a man by the name of David Fosmore and another man by the name of Charles Arnett. And I, I know these names are foreign to you, but they are dear to me. And others, I could go on. The list is lengthy. Leonard Chambers, people that invested in Christ for me to help me understand the Word of God, gave their time, gave themselves to me, helped me unpack the book of Romans and change my mind about God and about my life forever planting the seed of the gospel, leading me to faith in Christ, helping me to grow. Thank God for them. Others, who is it in your life that you would fill in the blank there that is an Epaphras in your life? How thankful I am for the faithful servants who ministered the gospel. Paul expressed his gratitude just in these first few verses, and then he prays for the people in the church of Colossae. What was he praying? Verse number 10, he's praying that they'll do God's will, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Walk worthy. We tell that to our trailmen all the time. Walk worthy. That's our motto. Walk worthy. And it's right out of this verse, Colossians 1.10. Paul was praying that they would do God's will. What does it mean to walk worthy? Do God's will. He prayed that they would be fruitful. Look at the rest of that verse. Being fruitful in every good work, everything you put your hand to. Paul's prayer was that it would bring forth fruit unto eternity. He prayed that they would be strengthened. Look at verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. You want to unpack some word studies? Get out your Greek dictionary and go to town. Here's a a verse to do that. Be strengthened. With all might, strengthened, might, power. Patience. People have told me, you know, I don't like to pray for patience anymore because God answers my prayer. We need to understand biblical patience. We must have biblical patience because patience produces a perfect work. It brings you to maturity in Christ in ways that you would otherwise not be able to grow. Long-suffering with joyfulness. He prayed that they would do God's will. He prayed that they would be fruitful. He prayed that they would be strengthened. He prayed that they would be thankful. Giving thanks, verse 12 through 14, unto the Father which hath made us meet. I mentioned it when I read it uh, earlier. That word meet means suitable. Uh, We are suitable for what? He hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance. He has made you a perfect fit through Jesus Christ to receive an inheritance that you can't even imagine. You are fit for that. You are suitable for that through Jesus Christ. The inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. For what were they to be thankful 
right here. We just bullet down. They were to be thankful for their inheritance in Christ. You want to be thankful for something? Thank God for the inheritance that you have in Jesus Christ. Thank God for the deliverance from the power of darkness. Thank God that you've been translated from Satan's kingdom into God's kingdom. Thank God that you've been redeemed, that you have redemption through His blood. Thank God that you have the forgiveness of sins. What a praise list. What a praise list. As I conclude, I trust that this message will give you great hope and give you a good example to follow concerning your action, your attitude toward yourself, your own circumstances, but then also toward other believers around you. First of all, we should show a great deal of gratitude for what God has done through Jesus Christ. And secondly, we should pray for God's best concerning those who labor in the gospel with us. Pray for God's best for them and rejoice when God uses others to further His Word and His will.